and it's always a pleasure to have a local author come to the store, especially one that supports us, and uh, who's also an expert in his field. Um, and in introducing him, I'll just simply um, mention the glowing Washington Post uh, review from Evan Thomas, who knows a thing or two about military history, uh, who calls Mark Perry uh, an excellent military history um, author who gets the personal element in the books, which I think gets to the heart of this one. So please uh, welcome Mark Perry. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you all for being here. I never quite know how to start these talks, so I'll just say this. Uh, my generation, the very good generation, but not the greatest generation. <laughs> Uh, when you do a book like this, you realize why they call it the greatest generation. If you uh, do a narrative of the Battle of Buna, for instance, you just think, how could they do it? Day after day in the swamps, sleeping in trenches filled with water, malaria, fighting the Japanese at night, standing on a Japanese pillbox and not even knowing you're standing on one. The 32nd Division had the highest rate of PTSD of any division of any war in American history because of BUNA. Post-traumatic stress disorder. They called it battle fatigue. That's why it's called the greatest generation because those young men and women who supported them were save the world, really, from militarism. Sorry. All right. How's that? All right, I'll try talking to the microphone. <laughs> Listen, I want to talk about uh, MacArthur, but I want to talk about MacArthur in a, in a, in a, in a little different way. Uh, MacArthur is not a beloved man in America. He's not even particularly well liked. If you like Harry Truman, then you must hate Douglas MacArthur <laughs> and vice versa. But I grew up in Wisconsin where my friends' fathers were members of the 32nd Division and MacArthur was a great hero. And MacArthur, for a Badger, is considered a very great man. The Wisconsin basketball team is in the Final Four, and they sing on Wisconsin, and they sing on Wisconsin because it was MacArthur's father in Missionary Ridge who yelled to his regiments, on Wisconsin. MacArthur is a pillar in Wisconsin. Why, what is it about him that we don't like? Why is it that historians would write, as they have written, that in World War II it seemed as if MacArthur had stumbled into the war, he didn't know what he was doing? Eric Larrabee hardly pays any attention to him. Max Hastings' History of World War II gives a couple pages on MacArthur's campaigns. And it, it always bothered me that people would say that a man like Franklin Roosevelt would exile MacArthur to the Southwest Pacific to get him out of the way so he wouldn't run for president. And that was the only reason. You mean to tell me that Franklin Roosevelt would sacrifice 15,000 American lives to run for the presidency? I just, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. So when I began to look at MacArthur I started to think about the way that we historians treat history. And if you, if you think about it, we look at historical figures and, and they loom, especially the leaders of World War II, they loom very large and they cast a shadow backwards, as we all do. And we remember the last great moments of people's lives. But if you look at MacArthur, from our perspective, the first thing that you bump into is Korea, where he was fired. And people think, well, 
he was insubordinate in Korea. He questioned presidential leadership in Korea. He was narrow-minded, egotistical, bad intelligence during Korea. That must be true. Let's find, let's find the seeds of that in World War II. They must be there. And I guarantee if, for history, if you look long enough for something bad that a historical figure has, has done, you're going to find it. So I thought, what if we wrote a book, what if I wrote a book, in which the shadow cast by Korea isn't there? What if MacArthur had retired after the Japanese surrender without the shadow of Korea? How would he be viewed now? Which is why I end this book in 1945, to tell about not simply the military campaigns of MacArthur, but the personality of the man during World War II, his interactions with Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, and with the President of the United States. How he played politics, but also how he fought and thought about war. And if you do that, if you write this book, if you're me and you write this book, and you end it with this surrender of Japan, you can only come to one conclusion. This man, whom so many dislike, was one of the most brilliant military minds of World War II. There's just, there's no doubt in my mind. So I, take a, I kind of take a positive outlook on MacArthur. I'd add this. American historians are now in the process of rethinking Harry Truman, the creator of the national security state, the man who threatened railroad striking workers with the draft. I thought it was an honor to serve in the military, not a threat. So if we rethink our history. If if we review what we think we know, sometimes it turns out we don't really know it that well. I would, I would also add this, and it, it kind of hit me many times when I was writing the book. For us, for we Americans, World War II is a European war. It's Eisenhower, Marshall, Bradley, and Patton. We have a huge movie about Patton, a classic movie about Patton. No similar movie has been done on any general or admiral for World War II. We've had, I grew up 1950s, 1960s. This was the age of World War II movies. The Guns of Navarone. Um, I mean, you could tick them off. Patton. There, isn't, there aren't any comparable movies to those movies when I was growing up. Japanese soldiers didn't come to the silver screen. One exception. The Bridge on the River Kwai, which is really about a British general, which didn't happen, by the way. We even, when I was a boy, we even had um, a comedy about pr allied prisoners of war in a German prisoner of war camp. It was called Hogan's Heroes. <laughs> Stalag 17, remember the big, fat, roly-poly German guy everyone made fun of? It was unimaginable. Can you imagine having a show on television about a Japanese prisoner of war camp and how much fun that must have been? And remember, <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. And remember what Eisenhower said to one of his subordinates after the defeat at Kasserine Pass. He said, you know, the problem with our boys is they just don't hate the Germans enough. <laughs> MacArthur never had to say that to his troops. We hated the Japanese. Our soldiers hated them. We had no problems killing them. The great heroes of World War II, our heroes, include... Germans, Rommel, the Desert Fox, Guderian, that 
brilliant guy. Huh? The longest day. Where are the great movies of the Japanese fight? We don't even call World War II in the Pacific World War II. We call it the Pacific War. The first ranking officer to serve on the Joint Chiefs of Staff after World War II from the Pacific Theater served 17 years after the Japanese surrender. Army Chief Staff George Decker. Every other major leader of the American post-war military was from Europe, not from our fight with Japan. So people say, listen, don't we already know the end of this story, the Japanese surrendered? I say, yeah, we know, but we don't know how that happened. We haven't gotten into the nitty gritty of who these people were, of the battles of, I'm sure you've all heard of them, but most Americans haven't. The Battle of Buna, of Biak, of Lone Tree Hill, of San Ananda, a bloody fight, San Ananda. MacArthur talked about it with Eisenhower after the war. Eisenhower said, hell, General, I've never, I've never even heard of San Ananda. So it's time for us, I think, to kind of, if we're going to revisit these times, if we're going to revisit this war, let's revisit all of it. Not just the great victories, but the really tough, difficult defeats and the leaders like Douglas MacArthur who make us uncomfortable but who were necessary, who understood the art of war that is the art of killing. And let's remember too the great captains of the Pacific War. Guys that, men, who most Americans don't remember or have conveniently forgotten about. Robert Eichelberger, who fought the Battle of Buna. George Kenney, who, who ran MacArthur's Air Force. Thomas Kincaid of MacArthur's Navy. These are really terrific Americans. And when the European War ended, George Marshall wanted to transfer the great commanders of Europe to take over for these commanders who MacArthur had worked with his whole campaign. Because Marshall thought the commanders in Europe, because they had fought the Germans, must be better commanders. Who now remembers Walter Kruger? But Walter Kruger was one of the really great American commanders of World War II and of all of American history. Uh, <coughs> I would add that on the way in here, a uh, gentleman in the back said, are you the guest tonight? And I said, I'm the guest. And he said, I just want to say I really like your title. So I'm going to talk about the title, and then I'll throw it open for your questions. Um, there is a man in American history, his name is Rexford Tugwell. Uh, Rexford Tugwell is one of my favorite people in American history because he was a problem solver, an economist out of Columbia University when, when Franklin Roosevelt was nominated for the presidency. He went to a friend of his, Ray Moley, and he said, listen, we're in the middle of a Great Depression. No one knows why we're in the middle of a Great Depression. Can you find me someone who will tell me what we need to do? Why are we here? And Moley said, I got a good friend of mine. His name is Rexford Tugwell. He's an economist. Uh, teaches at Columbia, and I'll set up an appointment. He set up an appointment, and after the 
uh, Roosevelt and Tugwell had been sitting for a while. Roosevelt turned to Tugwell and said, can you explain to me why we're in the Great Depression? I'm not sure many Americans know the answer now why we were in the Great Depression. Tugwell said, absolutely. He said, all right, what's the reason? He said, we have farmers growing wheat. After they harvest the wheat, they go stand in the bread line because they can't afford to buy the bread. Doesn't make any sense. Rosa said, wait, 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 what do you mean? He said, we have a surplus of wheat. It's not like anybody should be hungry. We've got bread lines. Roosevelt said, yeah, that's right. What do we do? He said, we raise the price of wheat. How do we do that, Roosevelt said. He said, let's call it price supports. And we'll actually take some wheat out of production and corn and rye and alfalfa. And Roosevelt said, so what's your explanation for the Great Depression? And Tugwell said, overproduction which is correct. So Roosevelt came into office with, Tux, with Rexford Tugwell at his arm and put in a system of price supports and Tugwell suggested that instead of guessing about economic data, we actually find out. Prior to the Great Depression, nobody counted the bushels of wheat. We just supposed there was a surplus. Nobody counted how much corn production there was. This was Rexford Tugwell, a genius. After Roosevelt got nominated, he invited Tugwell to the uh, governor's mansion in Albany. And he was sitting around with two of his secretaries and Tugwell and the phone rang. And the butler came in and said, Governor, it's Huey Long of Louisiana on the phone. And Roosevelt thought, oh. <laughs> Huey Long, that great politician, demagogue, great politician, movie about him recently. Anyway, people got up to leave. Roosevelt said, no, 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 you ought to hear this. So picked up the phone and said, hello, Huey, how you doing? Huey Long said, how am I doing? What the hell are you doing? You're up there in the governor's mansion talking to all the fat cats who got us into this trouble. You ought to be talking to me. Roosevelt said, no, no, Huey, everything will be okay. Don't worry. These, I, these are old friends. I'll get it. He goes, old friends? These are Wall Street moguls. They've stripped the American people. They bankrupted the economy, and they're on your campaign. You ought to be down here. I'll tell you how to run a campaign. Roosevelt rolled his eyes. Everyone in the room kind of heard the conversation through the phone. Roosevelt rolled his eyes and said, now, Huey, it's not time to start the campaign yet. This was the day after the bonus march when MacArthur broke up the bonus march. Bonus marches from World War I showed up in Washington, D.C., and Douglas MacArthur lit into them, and it was quite an embarrassment. So Huey said to Roosevelt, he said, Frank, did you ever see, did you see those headlines? What happened to those poor veterans? Roosevelt said, yeah, I'm looking at the headlines right now. I had a copy of the New York Times there. Finish the conversation, hung up the phone. Roosevelt let out a deep sigh, said, I'll invite Huey to the White House after I'm elected. I'll calm him down, he'll be okay. Tugwell said, Huey Long, the most dangerous man in America. Roosevelt said, no, 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 that's not true. He's not the most dangerous man in America. And Tugwell said, he's not, who is? Roosevelt said, General Douglas MacArthur is the most dangerous man in America. Now, Roosevelt said that because at the time, with 23% of unemployment in the country, people were looking for a savior. Who was Franklin Roosevelt? Just the governor of New York. He wasn't the man on the white horse who was going to raise his sword and carry America into the future. That was going to be Douglas MacArthur, Republican, conservative, tough guy. People worry in economic times about political stability. They always look to the man on the white horse. 
And Roosevelt said, we have to tame those fellows, Huey Long, Douglas MacArthur, and make them useful to us. So this book is about Douglas MacArthur, but it's about the relationship he had with Franklin Roosevelt and how Roosevelt tamed MacArthur, but also how, ironically, MacArthur used Roosevelt to get what he wanted. And more than anything, what MacArthur wanted was for American troops to return to the Philippines, his second home, the love of his life, a place where his father had served and where he'd served, a place he remembered from his youth and as a young officer. Both men got what they wanted, which was victory in World War II. This is that story. I hope you like it. It's a good book. You should buy a lot of copies. It's good for the whole family. I want to thank you for coming, and I'm happy to take your questions. I know it's just outside the span of this book, but would you give us a little bit of your reading as to why MacArthur succeeded in Japan? You know, he's the, he's the tough guy, he's the conservative, not necessarily the man you would pick to put Japan back together, in many cases adopting what looked to some as, as remarkably liberal policies. How did he get it right? Well, that's a great question. Um, one, one, of the, one of the real faults MacArthur had was that he picked members of his military staff who were consistently narrow-minded, um, fawning, poor thinkers, and with some notable exceptions, reactionaries. And I mean unbelievable reactionaries. One of his intelligence officers went later uh, after serving MacArthur to work for Francisco Franco, not exactly a charm school graduate. So when, you, when I study MacArthur in Japan, what, what amazes me is that is how stern he was in turning aside the concerns of a reactionary staff whom he'd appointed to be his court. So when they said, oh, you know, women shouldn't get the vote, he said, nope, women get the vote. And they said, we have to do something about labor unions. He said, yeah, we have to establish them in Japan. I mean, here was a man who was a conservative in the, in the very traditional Republican conservative Taft Scranton mold, not Senator Cruz Republican, but a real uh, conservative Republican who followed his instincts about what made America work. My, my answer to your question is the reason that uh, MacArthur succeeded in Japan is the worst reason possible, and it's narrow-minded, prejudiced, pro-American and imperialistic. He wanted to create America in Japan. What did America have? Labor unions, women's rights, baseball, popcorn, bars, strip joints, and he did it. He was in a position to do it. He was more powerful than the emperor, whom he recruited to collaborate with him. I think that that was his impetus. How do we make the world more like America? Now, today, people go, oh, my God, we can't have that. Well, guess what? That's what we have and in most, most parts of the world. And that's what we have in Japan. That's my answer. So quick comment. Um, I think I'm your age, or maybe a little older. And I think um, a lot of Americans think of the Pacific War, victory at sea, I mean, they may not know the names of the battles you mentioned, but they know Tarawa, they yep. know Guadalcanal, they know uh, Midway, yep. uh, Iwo Jima. Yes. Um, my question is, 
if he if he figured out Japan so well, how did he go wrong in Korea? Uh, it, that's a you know. <laughs> thank you for your question. Next next question. That's <laughs> um, a you know. I had a discussion about a four hour discussion with a brigadier general retired today, U.S. military, and. Um, because of the shooting, the tragic shooting yesterday, and I said, what the hell's going on? He said, well, we've gotten this, you know, we've gotten this from time to time, Mark. And I said, oh, you mean the, the uncomfortable war syndrome, Vietnam. You know, we had a hell of a problem after Vietnam with Vietnam veterans. And he said, no, 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 jo not just uncomfortable wars, any war, any war. It takes a lot to fight a war. Uh, the, you know, your very best soldiers are chewed to pieces in a war. Your army is chewed to pieces in a war. Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam. It was true after World War II. It was true after Vietnam. It was true after Iraq and Afghanistan. And I said, it was even true after World War II. He says, look at Korea. So we got our asses kicked in Korea first year. And we barely hung on the rest of the way. Uh, I, I, I think MacArthur got it right in Korea, and I point to Incheon, the Incheon landing, as having gotten it right. But that's really the only thing he got right, and that was by necessity. We needed to dig ourselves out of a very bad situation at the end of the peninsula. Inshan was the way to do it. It was a roll of the dice. He's damn lucky he got away with it. He went north. He had bad intelligence in the Chinese. He was writing letters to Congressman about Truman, and uh. you just can't do that. Uh, so I, you know, I think that he he got it he got it wrong, uh, but he understood that the United States Army that he was working with was not the army that he was working with in World War II. But we had a whole card to play, and that was nuclear weapons. And he thought, you know, let's play it. It wasn't his call, and that's why he was relieved. Thank you. Let's, let's get back to December 1941. How does MacArthur, this brilliant general, how does he address Clark Field, the disaster, the catastrophe that happened at Clark Field, eight hours after Pearl Harbor? I hope you read the book. <laughs> it's a great question. It is the question. And I did a lot of work on it. Uh, Eric Larrabee wrote a book called Commander-in-Chief in which he said, how could Douglas MacArthur have allowed his own Air Force to be bombed, Clark Field? And I thought, allowed? You mean to tell me that MacArthur let it happen? He was a traitor? So you take a look at December 7th and December 8th. When the United States Naval Base of Pearl Harbor was bombed at 7.05, on the morning of December 8th, it was 3.05 on, on the morning of December 7th, it was 3.05 in the morning of December 8th. And the phone call came in from Washington to MacArthur about 20 minutes after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And MacArthur's first reaction was that this was a Japanese defeat. And he called his staff and they called all the commanders uh, of his uh, United States Army Air Forces, a man by the name of Lewis Brereton, and Thomas Hart, who was a Navy commander. And they got themselves out of bed, having been in bed for five minutes. Because the night of the bombing of Pearl Harbor in the Philippines, there was a party in Manila. And Louis Brereton had just gotten back to his quarters, put on his uniform, and went to war, drove to MacArthur's headquarters, and reported to MacArthur's chief of staff, Richard Sutherland, and Sutherland said, I need to talk to Douglas MacArthur right away. 
and Sutherland refused him access to MacArthur. Why? If it's the one guy who MacArthur needs to see, it's his commander of the Air Force. Sutherland said, you can't see him. Go back to Clark Field and organize your forces. So Brereton went back, then went back to MacArthur's headquarters, and Sullivan said, I've given MacArthur your message. You can't see him. So go back to your command. So Brereton went back to Clark Field, and he put his bombers and his fighters in the air. At 11 o'clock, MacArthur called and said, what have you done? He said, I put my bombers and my fighters in the air, and we are, we are planning an attack on Formosa. And MacArthur said, you have to do a reconnaissance first. Do a reconnaissance of Japanese airfields on Formosa first. We don't even know where to bomb. We have flight folders. We don't know where their airfields are. Do a reconnaissance, get back to me. I approve your deployments. Raritan pulled back his Air Force, landed all of his planes, almost all of them. And in that moment, the Japanese bombed. Now, you can say bad luck, because Clark Field isn't the only place that happened. Until the United States got up to speed and got into the tempo of the war, and we struggled to do that, there were a lot of instances where there were more surprises than there should have been. So you can say bad luck. But that's not a good historical answer, and you can't put it in a book. I read a um, very lengthy series of eight interviews with George Marshall about his relationship with MacArthur and what happened that day. I know this is a long answer, but it's, it's really interesting, believe me. Um, and after the war, Marshall told this interviewer, as it turns out, the airman in charge in the Philippines who MacArthur had to work with was not up to standard. And I thought, what does that mean? <coughs> so Lewis Brereton served the rest of the war. He was the commander during the Ploesti raid, which is a catastrophe in Romania. Not up to standard was the Marshall phrase. And if you look through Marshall's papers, and you look through efficiency reports of commanders of World War II, you'll come across the phrase not, not, phrase, not up to standard. And here's what it means. He was drunk. <laughs> he got five minutes sleep after a, quite a raucous party, and Sutherland didn't admit him to see MacArthur because if he had, MacArthur would have dismissed him on the spot. The pictures that I've seen of Clark Field show groups of planes in fours, four, almost like a cross. Wingtip to wingtip. Tied together as if they've never been in the air. Would you mind moving up a little bit? My, uh, he said that the pictures he's seen at Clark Field show the airplanes wingtip to wingtip in a cross formation never having been in the air. The U.S. Army Air Force official history says otherwise. Uh, and I rely on the official history in this particular instance and throughout the book because it is authoritative. Uh, historians going out and asking questions. If you believe that MacArthur allowed his Air Force to be bombed, then you have to conclude that MacArthur was a traitor to his country. And I don't think he was. I don't. I think it was a catastrophe. Pearl Harbor was a catastrophe. The sinking of the uh, Prince of Wales and the Repulse were catastrophes for the British. It was a Guam was taken in 24 hours. Wake was gone. Nobody was ready. We had 57 airplanes on the ground at Clark Field. 57. The Japanese had hundreds. If MacArthur had put his, even if MacArthur had been able to foretell the future, and if Brereton had been sober, and if the planes had been in the air, they'd have been shot out of the air. The Japanese had done their reconnaissance. They didn't need to do a reconnaissance. It had been done. They didn't attack us with hundreds of airplanes, with thousands. 
They put 40,000 men on the beach in one day in the Philippines. And many of some of those 40,000 might have been killed on, in ships had the bombs, had the planes been in the air. There were planes left over from Clark Field and the, and, and the Navy back in Washington said, we need to get them out of there and hand them to Mindanao. They're gonna be dead. We didn't have an Air Force in 1941. We didn't have an army. It wasn't even close. The first year of the war wasn't even close. It wasn't. In 1940, the Congress came within a vote of voting down the draft because key congressmen said, if we have a draft, that'll tell the Japanese we want a war. We can't piss them off. We didn't have a military. We weren't ready. Study the history of the 1930s. They cut the army budget and cut it and cut it and cut it. That's a fact. It's not like we have now. We have a standing army. The result of the Cold War. We have the best. We could defeat the Egyptian Air Force before breakfast. We didn't have the number of airplanes, men, and Navy we needed in the Pacific till 1943. They were sitting on their hands getting ready for torch in 1942. We were fighting with two National Guard divisions, the 48th and 32nd New Guinea. Tarawa didn't take place until 43. We did the rope-a-dope for a year. We were awful. That's the truth. I know the great triumph of American arms. Every once in a while, we really take it in the chin. And the we took it in the, the chin. Top bears the res ultimate responsibility. Thanks. We're going to move on to the next question. Thank you. The animus towards MacArthur is really something. <laughs> Isn't it? Unbelievable. Why? Harry Truman. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I'd like to follow up just a little bit on that by extending the conversation into the Philippine campaign after the 7th of December 1941. Your book, which I've not read yet, by the way, but your book sounds like you're assessing MacArthur on the basis of his military campaign management during the Pacific War, which is exactly the way he would like to be assessed. How would you assess the period of his command in the Philippines from, say, the 8th of December up until the early spring of 1942? Good and bad. Um, Wainwright, his American uh, field commander, said in his memoirs that if he had been MacArthur, he would not have forward deployed uh, forces to meet the Japanese in northern Luzon after they landed at Lingan Gulf on December 22nd. Uh, it's worth noting that MacArthur did not deploy American troops into northern Luzon after the Japanese landed, but Philippine troops, that is, cannon fodder. Untrained young men that held defensive lines with their bodies, while American troops dug in on baton. And I think it was a very purposeful, if cruel, cold-blooded, but inevitably effective strategy. Wainwright was never going to hold those lines. The only thing he could do was slow down the Japanese. That's what MacArthur wanted him to do. That's good. Depending on who you are. That's good. What was bad was MacArthur told his logistics chief, a brilliant man by the name of Richard Marshall, to supply those troops with whatever he could find. And Marshall was scandalized because he thought that they ought to take all the food stores and ammunition they could and move them into Bataan and to hell with the Philippine army. And he was right. We'd have had a better shot at defending Bataan and Corregidor for a longer period of time if MacArthur had not given that order. He reversed it, but it was too late. The orange plan, as it was called, for the retreat into 
Bataan, the Bataan Peninsula and Corregidor said that we ought to be able to feed 40,000 soldiers and civilians for six months with the stores that were already there. There were 132,000 people on Bataan and Corregidor and couldn't feed them for four months. So that, I think that that was the bad. That it was a mistake for MacArthur to give that order. When he realized it, he reversed it. Sir? Um, I, I, I'm under the impression from things that I've read about MacArthur, not your book yet, um, that there were incidents in his career that undermined his greatness. And um, so, for instance, my impression is he was incapable of not returning to the Philippines. And I think that that's an incident of, of that, or at least a potential one. You mean after the war? No, no, during the war, of bypassing the Philippines. No, MacArthur wanted to return to the Philippines. Nimitz and the Navy wanted to bypass the Philippines. Uh, MacArthur wanted to return to the Philippines because it was an American colony and he thought Roosevelt and the United States owed the Philippines their liberation. And that, and the Navy thought it would be a bad strategy to return to the Philippines, that it should be bypassed, and that the United States axis of advance should be on Formosa. Now, as it turned out, that debate became a non-debate because Nimitz and Halsey decided that Leyte was virtually undefended, which wasn't true, uh, and that Nimitz would, could use Luzon's air bases to protect his left wing when he took Okinawa. So much to the chagrin of the chief of naval operations at the time, or the commander-in-chief of the Navy, Ernie King, Nimitz argued for the invasion of the Philippines. And Roosevelt supported an invasion of the Philippines. And you'll have to read the book. But uh, I think that um, there was a deal. We were going to go back to the Philippines anyway. But... Uh, President Franklin Roosevelt used references to MacArthur quite liberally during his campaign because MacArthur was a Republican and said, what about all this criticism I'm hearing from the Republicans and not helping MacArthur? He's returning to the Philippines with my blessing, which undercut the Republicans, and MacArthur let him do it because he wanted to return to the Philippines. So war is not without politics. For those of you who think this is a battle book, this is the politics of war. It's about the politics of war. So that, thank you. That's my answer. Come on. Mark, I think we'll make this the last question. One last question. Two, two. Right, go two. ahead. Okay. Two. Go ahead, Mark. Mark, congratulations. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna prod you to do a little. Indulge in a little speculation. Um, in the weeds of the military art. Mm. Um, you make the point in the last chapter of the book that MacArthur was the first real successful practitioner of what Boy. is now known as combined arms warfare. He gave a <coughs> lot of authority and responsibility to what are now known as component commanders. It took four decades until we had any real reform of how the military is organized, training, equipped, and warfare, as you know, in the Goldwater-Nichols Goldwater Act. Nichols. What would have MacArthur thought of the United States military today after the Goldwater-Nichols Act? Yeah. Um, I warned it was in the weeds. Sorry. Uh, in 1986-87, the U.S. Congress passed the Goldwater-Nichols Military Reform Act, which required the Army, Navy, and Air Force to work together and train together 
so that we so that Air Force fighter jets wouldn't have to figure out what frequency ground troops were on when they radioed them. It was that bad. Each service has their own branch and culture, and they often fight each other. And a lot of this story here is about how Marshall used MacArthur to fight the Navy, not just the Japanese. Um, and here's the thrust of this question. From 1945 to 1987, we didn't have unified, what are called unified commands, where Army, Air, and Navy assets really worked well together. MacArthur was the first one to do it. Uh, when I was on the verge of writing this book, I went to see a very senior military officer. I won't give his name, a three-star lieutenant general. And I said, I'm doing a book on MacArthur. He said, I don't like him. And I said, what about Operation Cartwheel? And he said, what's Operation Cartwheel? Operation Cartwheel in military history is, is referred to as the reduction of Rabaul, the great Japanese bastion of the Southwest Pacific, where MacArthur, in order to reduce Rabaul, was forced to get his component commands, the US Army Air Force, the US Navy, the U.S. Army, and even the U.S. Marines to all work together in a combined operation battlefield campaign. The first time it had ever been done in history. The Romans didn't have a navy. Alexander the Great didn't need one. There were no great naval battles unless you count Jutland, World War I. So this was really the first time that a, an American general got all the service to work together, and it was really important. Now, to your question, what would MacArthur have thought about our current military? At the end of World War II, MacArthur thought that guys like him, he used the phrase, guys like me, our day is done. From now on, we're going to depend on a lieutenant to push a button that will set off an atomic bomb, and that guy will be a four-star general. That's not exactly the way it turned out. That's what he feared, that like Patton, the great nobility of battle, courage, and men going over the top, and the fraternity of, you know, this bunk. He loved that. He was an army man. He loved that stuff. And he was afraid that we were at the end of that. I think, um, I think MacArthur would have stayed true to what he believed. He told John F. Kennedy that the greatest weapon of any American president was a naval blockade. This was a year before the Cuban Missile Crisis. Kennedy used the naval blockade. Kennedy liked MacArthur. He served in the Southwest Pacific. And he thought that Inter-service rivalry was the greatest impediment to victory in World War II, earlier victory. And he said, never get involved in a land war in Asia. So, if you take a look at where we've been and where we are, the minute that any president said, I know, shock and awe, let's go to Baghdad, MacArthur would have said, you are out of your mind. We have no business doing this. Let's not do it. These wars, some wars are just unwinnable. Let's not get involved in them. Let's focus on our national interest. The business of America is business. And the United States has no business getting, inv getting involved in countries in which it doesn't have business. I don't know how many exports we get from Afghanistan. It's only my personal opinion, but probably not many. So MacArthur would have been a true blue American and pro-army and the core, the core, the core, but he would have maintained his principles on what works and what doesn't. And we have one last question, sir, go ahead. You mentioned earlier revisionist history, and I'm just curious from your perspective as a military historian, <clears throat> what are the, some of the key areas of revisionist history, either in the European theater or the Pacific theater, that that are troublesome to you? 
Well, it's, um, you're asking my opinion, <laughs> so I'll give it. You, you ever watch the Olympics, the <coughs> opening ceremonies of the Olympics? I just, I just loved the opening. Here they were in Sochi in Russia, and I thought, we're going to see Russian history in these opening ceremonies. I want to really, I want to really want to see how Putin and crew approach Russian history. And you had those doll, you had the thing about the dolls and St. Petersburg. And I thought, I can't wait to see, to figure out how they treat Stalingrad, because Stalingrad is what turned World War II into an Allied victory. Not Normandy, not Iwo Jima, Stalingrad. And here's how the Russians treated it. Not at all. They airbrushed it out. But the one, you know, the one thing I would like Americans to understand is the greatest generation was not just an American generation. Think of this. <clears throat> the Soviet Union, the Russian army, the Red Army, executed 157,000 of their own soldiers in 1943 for retreating. That's half the total cost of the number of dead that we expended. 157,000 soldiers were shot for retreating. It wasn't World War II. It was a war of national annihilation. And the greatest generation means them too. And the second thing, and it's starting to happen now, there's a terrific book out which you should buy after you buy a copy of my book <laughs> called Forgotten Ally about Japan's war in China, uh, which cost Japan World War II. One of the admirals of the Imperial Japanese Navy recommended to the Prime Minister, the dictator Tojo, that Japan withdraw from China and throw everything it had in the Americans, which would have been over a million troops. Can you imagine if they had made that decision? We'd have been invading Japan in 1947. So a focus, now finally, after many years, 50 years, because the archives are open in China, we're starting to remember the incredible bloodletting in China and the suffering of the Chinese people and the reason why MacArthur said never get involved in a land war in Asia is because Japan did and it cost them World War II. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.